Now, I would like to move on to discuss the state of the campaign that Amar and Brian led us through and how well that we did and surprised everyone by our improvements over 2016. I'd like to start with Bryce Worgan, who is also our production manager tonight. And I want to thank Bryce for volunteering and stepping in to uh, handle Zoom and to make sure that everyone gets where they need to be and are brought in. Uh, Bryce, could you please tell us about the election results? Thank you, Albert. <laughs> and thank you, Tony. My name is Bryce Morgan. I am a state committee member from North Carolina. And uh, I, along with Desmond Silvera, who you'll hear from later, have spent some time tracking down the election results for the campaign. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief rundown of those results. Um, so in the 2020 election, Brian Carroll and Amar Patel were listed on the ballot in eight states, which are displayed on the screen here in orange. Uh, 19 of the states, they're depicted in purple, that, that provided us with a tally of the write-in votes from every county and town, although we are aware of some serious irregularities in both Texas and Massachusetts. Um, in Tennessee, we were required to submit forms to each county to get them to count our write-in votes, and we were successful in at least 71 out of the 95 counties, representing 82% of the vote. I say at least because there were about 10 or so that didn't tell us whether we were successful and we got zero votes there, so don't know. Uh, in three states, colored yellow on the map, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New Hampshire, we have managed to obtain some partial data by contacting the counties and towns around the state. In the other 20 states, plus DC, that are shown here in white or gray, uh, our votes were not counted. Uh, to this point, I record a total of 42,224 votes for Brian. Now, Brian mentioned 48,000 just a second ago, oh, and I think that if we counted all the votes, uh, we'd be closer to that, um, or even all the votes in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, but in 2016, Mike Matorin and Juan Munez total 6,777 votes. So this translates to a growth of 523%. I've broken down the numbers further by comparing what type of ballot access we had in 2016 and what type of ballot access we had in 2020. Uh, as you can see, roughly 50% of our votes came from states uh, where we didn't have any ballot access in 2016. Uh, I also wanna highlight the massive jump in states where we were a write-in in 2016 and a and on the ballot in 2020. And I think this really shows just how much of a difference there is um, uh, go, moving from being a write-in to being on the ballot. Um, by comparing that to the states where we stayed at the same level of ballot access, uh, we're able to conclude that uh, moving from a write-in to full ballot access multiplies our vote total by about seven times. Um, but we should also note that uh, in the states where um, are we maintain the same level of ballot access from four years ago, uh, our vote totals more than doubled. Uh, so we can tell that there has been substantial growth in the party over the past four years, not just better ballot access. Uh, overall, we finished 10th highest among all candidates. Uh, as you oh, here on the screen, uh, all the candidates except for the two major ones. Uh, well, not all of them. Um, uh, a good sampling of the uh, uh, candidates other than the two major ones. However, other than the top four parties, um, the Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, and Greens, a lot of our finish can be attributed to how much ballot access uh, candidates have. For example, uh, Rocky De La Fuente and Gloria Riva, who are third and fourth on this list, uh, both got over half, around half their votes from the state of California, uh, where they were on the ballot and we were not. Um, and Brock Pierce, who's right above us, uh, received about half of his votes out of the state of New York, where he was on the ballot and we were not. Uh, so um, I think that uh, uh, we're very clearly in um, the third tier of parties in, in this country uh, and hopefully with the growth over the next four years, we'll be able to make it up, at least even with the Libertarians and the Greens. Uh, I, I, um, so here's a map depicting 
uh, the Brian's vote percentage by state, ranging from light tan on the low end to dark red on the high end. Uh, the gray and blue states are the areas where our votes are not counted. Uh, and the first thing you notice is just how much better you can see that we performed in the on-ballot states. Um, we obtained a higher percentage of the vote in every state where we were on the ballot than in any state where we were just a write-in, although it was, it was close between Vermont and Kansas, Vermont being the ballot state uh, and Kansas being a write-in state. And so I think this really drives home the earlier point about the benefits of actually achieving ballot access. Uh, a few highlights, uh, we finished in fourth place in Wisconsin, beating Don Blankenship of the Constitution Party. We finished in fifth in both Illinois and Louisiana. Um, our largest vote total, over 9,000 votes, came out of Illinois, and our best state by percentage was Wisconsin, uh, where we got 0.16% of the vote, or about one out of every 600 voters. Uh, among the write-in states, our largest vote total was in Texas, with over 3,200 votes. Uh, our best percentage of the vote in write-in states occurred in Kansas, where we got about one out of every 2,400 voters. Um, in most of the states, we ended up with the largest number of write-in votes. Uh, the only candidates we ever lost to uh, for write-in votes were the Green Party and Kanye West. Um, and of particular note is Minnesota, where we had more votes than the socialist worker candidate, Allison Kennedy, who actually appeared on the ballot. Um, so here's a map depicting Brian's percentage of the vote by county. Um, so the same color scheme as before, uh, because it's by county, we get into some of those extremes of the light tan and the darker red. Um, and we also have uh, some counties you can see in a lighter gray in Pennsylvania and New Jersey where we haven't heard back from them. I've emailed them, I've called them. They don't want to give us any information. So, um, uh, so, and the counties in white are the counties where we received zero vote. So here I think there's a bigger contrast between the on ballot and the writing states. Uh, in the writing states, there are large swaths of counties where we receive no votes at all. And in the on ballot states, we receive votes in almost every county. Um, I think there, uh, that outside of Colorado, there are only three counties where we were on the ballot and didn't receive any votes, and no matter how small they were. Um, our best county by raw vote uh, were the large cities of Illinois and Wisconsin, including 1,500 votes in Cook County, Illinois, uh, the home of Chicago. Uh, by percentage of the vote, our best county was Taylor County, a county of 10,000 voters in rural northern Wisconsin, where we received 1.7% of the vote and actually finished in third place overall ahead of Joe Jorgensen of the Libertarians. Uh, our second best county was Brown County, Illinois, a county of 2,500, uh, where we received 1.6% of the vote uh, and only eight votes behind the Libertarians. Um, in the write-in states, we averaged about 0.02% of the vote, or about one out of every 5,000 voters. Uh, in 13 counties, we managed to exceed one out of every 1,000 voters, including 10 rural counties, six in Kansas, three in Texas, and one in Georgia, as well as the home counties of the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, Franciscan University in Ohio, and Texas A&M University. Uh, although there are many rural counties where we are still unknown, I find the fact that our growth is not concentrated to the large population centers to be very encouraging. In fact, in one rural Missouri county, we obtained more votes in the Constitution Party, even though they were on the ballot and we were not. So, uh, you know, everything I've seen shows that this party is on an upward trajectory, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we grow over the next four years. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll turn it over to um the desmond so he can talk a little bit more about the campaign i'd like to introduce myself my name is desmond silver i was the campaign manager for the uh brian carroll campaign uh in 2016 i also served as the campaign manager for the mike matern campaign um uh i thank um bryce for his detailed analysis i i'm a, a data guy so I have um, a high appreciation for that. I'm gonna go over uh, some of what we did 
in the campaign, some of our process and operations. Um, uh, it was a, a difficult year, particularly because of the, the lockdown. Uh, uh, we had, pr prior to um, the pandemic hitting, we had plans for a lot of uh, on the ground signature gathering. That, um, that didn't work out well be because um, of the, the restrictions. Um, as uh, Bryce pointed out, we, we made it onto the ballot in Arkansas, Colorado, Illinois, Louisiana, Mississippi, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Um, each, each, uh, each state has very, very different requirements. Each state throughout the United States has very different requirements for getting on the ballot. For some of them, it's um, reasonably easy, the, the easiest one being Colorado. And for others, uh, it can be extremely, extremely difficult with uh, the requirement to get tens of thousands of signatures in order to get ballot access. Um, for, uh, Colorado, um, I'll, I'll briefly go over some of the requirements for some of the, the states. Colorado just need um, $1,000 as a fee. Um, Arkansas needed 1,000 signatures. This uh, campaign was our first experience using professional signature gatherers. Uh, we learned a lot in the process. Um, there are some uh, issues, some, uh, the, the, the professional signature gatherers need to be watched um, a bit closely because uh, sometimes they can uh, not be as reliable as, as we hope. And that caused um, some challenges for us in, in certain states. Um, uh, one of the highlights, as, as Bryce pointed out, was Illinois. Um, normally, to get on the ballot in Illinois, you need 25,000 signatures. Because of the lockdown, most states uh, adjusted requirements in some way or another. Uh, Illinois cut that requirement from 25,000 signatures to 2,500. In Mississippi, we uh, normally it would take about a thousand. It would take a thousand signatures, but we uh, pursued party recognition. So our party is uh, formally recognized in Mississippi, and this prevented the need for signature gathering. Uh, we we did use paid signature gatherers in Rhode Island to get uh, the 1,000 signature requirement. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, a, a big shout out to Marianne and David Bobby for all their on the ground um, signature gathering, but we also supplemented their work with uh, paid signature gatherers to get the 2,000 requirement. Um, as Bryce said, we, we were on a, a whole lot of write-in states uh, again, the requirements were uh, diverse throughout the states. We, we got on to 32 uh, states as qualified as a qualified write-in candidate. That amounts to uh, 397 electoral college votes, higher than any other candidate. In total, uh, with our ballot access uh, electoral votes, that's 300, uh, I mean, 463 electoral votes. Uh, certain challenges uh, were certainly apparent during our campaign process, um, uh, and that that led to a lot of different. Well, we we learned a lot through the process. Um, for example, Arizona and Maine uh, had some difficulty because um, we we weren't sure whether there should be a single point person in in each state uh, for collecting and coordinating uh, versus people sending in their uh, forms directly to the state. Uh, in hindsight, we now know that um, it's certainly better to have a single point person instead of a distributed responsibility. Um, and that led uh, to some of the difficulties that we had in getting the access in Arizona and Maine. Uh, there were also, um, because, also because of the, the 
COVID situation, ma uh, mail delivery was especially slow and that hurt us in West Virginia where we sent in the paperwork on time, but they didn't receive it on time and we got disqualified in that case. Uh, in Montana and, and many states actually, uh, those who worked at the elections office were less available, often working from home. So um, we uh, co outreach to the Montana elections division was re uh, re frequent, but we didn't generally get prompt responses and and failed to make it onto the ballot because of that. Um, and then in Washington, D.C., I believe everything was submitted on time and properly, but they just didn't count us. Um, and we didn't get an explanation why, of why they didn't certify us as uh, a certified candidate. Um, as I'm getting an indication that my internet is a little flaky. I apologize for that. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, as far as the operations of the campaign goes, uh, for the past I've been having a weekly scrum. Uh, every Saturday morning, um, the various, uh, not, not everyone, but uh, various state leads, uh, Brian and myself would, would get on a Zoom call much like this and, and discuss what was done what needed to be done and uh, potential barriers. Um, we used a lot of um, online project management tools like Trello and uh, Google Sheets to to collaborate and show information. Uh, fund gather, uh, fundraising and finances were a shared responsibility between the campaign and the national party with um, the national are using their infrastructure to to names. Um, it's it's a much more difficult situation to that on, on their own because of the reporting requirements. Um, and then, as far as uh, promotion goes, I believe that our best means of promotion was Wikipedia. We kept uh, the site updated with. Um, with our campaign information. And a lot of people found out about our campaign through the election Wikipedia pages. Uh, there was also a lot of activity uh, in promoting us via Facebook groups, Twitter. Um, and we also collabor collaborated with other organizations like Free and Equal Elections Foundation and Open the Debates to make sure that Brian Carroll made it onto the um, uh, onto the debate stage. Um, in the future, we will consider uh, other means of promotion like uh, SEM, uh, search engine marketing, and email campaigns. Uh, but uh, we we did learn a lot from this current campaign. And with that, uh, I I don't mean to. Uh, take up too much of your time. I'll, I'll pass that back to uh, Albert. Thank you, Desmond, for that uh, good analysis, and you and Bryce as well, for helping us to see how the campaign unfolded, and we can use that data, especially for planning a future campaigns, especially in 2024 and even before then.